I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations in the name of our Lord. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. I am your caffeine-imbued host, Page. Here's my coffee. Mm. In the beginning, the Lord created the coffee bean, and lo, the angels rejoiced, because it was very good. <sighs> well, today we're going to be uh, continuing on in our journey in Numbers chapter 10. Israel's going to start their march towards the promised land. And uh, I want to thank you for allowing me the liberty of taking a little sojourn away from numbers yesterday to discuss uh, the emotions and the thoughts that God is roiling up inside of me as I'm reading through this. It, it, what's amazing about this devotional approach to, this, to Bible, to reading the Bible for me, is that every day I wake up, and I know I'm going to be reading a new chapter. And I don't know what waits for me there. It's an adventure for me. I'm not doing a lot of stuff. Sometimes I'll study ahead at time if there's, if there's something coming up that's really got my attention and I really want to know stuff. But primarily, I'm reading and reacting. And you get to be on the sidelines watching that happen. Uh, this is not a deep dive into the scripture in any way, shape, or form. You're watching me think with my mouth open. <sighs> to me, in my mind, the devotional approach is successful if you see something about God in what you're reading and if you see something in about you in what you're reading. My purpose in this is I want God to change me and my life has has been changing in large ways since I started doing this. I've been doing this over a year now. Gone through the New Testament, and I'm up through Numbers. I've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, well, part of Leviticus anyway. And then now I'm into Numbers. And I am always surprised, pleasantly so, and sometimes unpleasantly so, when I feel God is speaking to me out of what I'm reading. Uh as we continue on, I'm coming at this Old Testament story through the eyes of the writer of Hebrews who, who says that the tabernacle and everything associated with it is like a shadow of the perfect thing. It's a picture of the perfect thing. It's not the perfect thing, but it's a picture of it. So we can look at it and we can draw allegorically, if you will, or metaphorically, whichever word you choose to use, we can draw from these examples and apply that and look at it, our lives, in, as it relates to that. And today, Israel is beginning their journey. Now, let's, there's three phases to journey's entrance into the Holy Land. One, they were slaves in Egypt, and they were released from that slavery in Egypt. I was once a slave to sin. No choice, no call in the matter. I was a slave to sin. Israel is delivered from slavery to Israel. I was delivered from my sin nature. It is no longer the primary force at work in my life. Israel has been delivered from that. Now, Israel still has to deal with the repercussions of a lifetime in slavery. Same with me. I'm still dealing with issues in my life that my sin nature revolves around. And now they've been delivered. They're at Sinai, Mount Sinai. I call that the conversion of Israel. That's me. 
when wine is converted. And now they're getting ready to start their journey to the Jordan River. Well, that journey is a picture of my life as I journey towards my Jordan River. When they cross over the Jordan River in the promised land, that's a picture of me crossing over from this life to the next. There's a song out there, Wayfaring Stranger, and it sings about how we go through this life looking at the time when we cross over the Jordan River to be in the presence of God with our loved ones. That's us. And this journey that Israel's about to set out on, it's a bumpy one. Guess what? Our life is bumpy, isn't it? So as I read through this uh, story of Israel marching towards the Jordan River and the Promised Land, it would behoove me to pay attention to the fact that even in the midst of this entire, what apparent appears to be a rebellious nation, and they are rebellious, there's still a remnant of people who are true followers of God. Like that old pastor told me once, in the church, you'll find two groups of people, the church visible and the church invisible. The church visible is everybody you see around you at church on Sunday morning. The church invisible are those who will still be there when trials and tribulation cause the others to fall away. When we read about there being a massive uh, falling away in the church, it's those people, the people who really in their heart of hearts were not followers of God and were there for other reasons. Not all of Israel is of Israel. Does that make sense? Not everybody who comes to church is really part of the church. Now, we can't tell what's what and who's who. God does. God sorts it out. But as Israel journeys towards their Jordan River experience, that's a picture of me journeying to my Jordan River experience. When I reach the point where God calls me home to cross over that Jordan River, I will be going into my promised land where my journey will be over and I will be in the land of milk and honey. That's the picture that's being presented here. So let's go on to uh, chapter 10 and let's watch Israel begin their journey. Here we are. The Lord said to Moses, make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and for having the camp set out. When both are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So that means there's going to be a harmony of some kind, two notes. Uh, If only one is sounded, then only the leaders assemble. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. And at the sounding of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be the signal for setting out. To gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the signal for setting out. So they're going to have a set of signals that the trumpets will uh, be sounding out. The sons of Aaron, the priests, are to blow the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you and the generations that come. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord, your God, and rescued from your enemies. Also at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and new moon feasts, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, and I'm assuming that that's dating it from their time of their release from Egypt, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place, until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. Forgive me, because I'm going to butcher some of these names. I'm going to do my best. The divisions of the camp of Judah went first, under their standard. Nashon, son of Amenadab, was in command. Nethanel, son of Zuar, was over the division of the tribe of Issachar. And Eliab, son of Helon, was over the division of the tribe of Zebulun. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the Gershonites and the Merorites who carried it set out. The divisions of the camp of Reuben went next, under their standard. Eliezer, son of Shedir, was in command. Shelumiel, son of Zerashaddai, was over the division of the tribe of Simeon. And Eliasaph, son of Deol, was over the division of the tribe of Gad. Then the Kohathites set out, carrying the holy things. The tabernacle was to be set up before they arrived. The divisions of the camp of Ephraim went next. 
under their standard. Elishama, son of Amihud, was in command. Gamaliel, son of Pereshur, was over the division of the tribe of Manasseh. And Abidan, son of Gideonai, was over the division of the tribe of Benjamin. Finally, as a rear guard for all units, the divisions of the camp of Dan set out under their standard. Ahizar, son of Amishadai, was in command. Pegiel, son of Okran, was over the division of the tribe of Asher. And Ahira, son of Enan, was over the division of the tribe of Naphtali. This was the order of the march for the Israelite divisions as they set out. Now, Moses said to Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we're setting out for the place about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well, for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we'll share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that statement. Because isn't the Lord supposed to be leading them? The, the, the cloud lifts up, they follow. The cloud stops, they stop. And the Lord is guiding them. But yet Moses is asking this gentleman to come along and be their eyes and ears in the wilderness. I mean, it makes sense. You want somebody who knows the land. Uh, but I just don't, I just don't understand that part. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. And the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them during those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Now, whenever the Ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. All right, their journey starts. And... At this point, they're walking in obedience. But we know what's going to happen next, right? They're going to they're gonna fall. You know what? That's such a perfect picture of my Christian life. I start, I remember the day I got saved. It was a powerful emotional experience. And I walked away from that church service dead certain that life was about to get easier. I was a wee bit disappointed when I found out that that is not the case. Just because you are delivered from bondage doesn't mean the habits learned while you were in bondage are going to vanish. Israel was used to being told what to do. Israel was used to being in slavery. Israel was used to being in bondage. And you're going to find out as the story unfolds that they're going to be continually looking back at when they were slaves and saying, we'd rather have that. But before you get on your high horse and start criticizing Israel, I hope you'll consider as I did the fact that I am Israel. I'm continually disobeying and looking back at the way things used to be. And I'm continually going back to old habits and old patterns. We talked about that yesterday, about how sometimes I can actually be... Uh, so ashamed and embarrassed that I have to go to God once again to ask him to forgive me for my disobedience and rebellion, that I'm sometimes frozen in place. Well, this march from Mount Sinai to the promised land for Israel is going to be a metaphor for my life. But I have to realize that within the greater Israel is a remnant that remains faithful to God. Not all who are in Israel are of the true Israel. And that's a picture of our church, isn't it? The, our Gentile church, if you will. Not all who are in the church are truly the real church. And you know, this might be why the instructions given in the New Testament to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Are we part of the church visible only, but not part of the church invisible? We should check on that. I am not afraid to go back and check on the status of my Christianity. I know that I'm saved, but I still go back and review it. Do I believe that God, Jesus was raised on the third day? Yes, I do. 
Do I confess him as Lord day to day? Yes, I do. Then I am saved. God so loved Paige, he gave his only begotten son, that if Paige should believe on him, and believe on him means believing in such a way that you base your actions based on that belief. In other words, I believe this chair will support me. And to prove it to you, I sit down in it. That if Paige believes in him, I won't perish, but have everlasting life. I look to my salvation continually. And part of the reason for that is because of these this bumpy ride towards the Jordan River. Sometimes I sin in such a way that I just can't imagine how could a child of God act this way? And I wrestle with that. And that was the reason for yesterday's devotional. So Israel's getting ready to start out on the journey. It's going to be a bumpy one. Guess what? I'm in my journey. I'm closing in on the Jordan River without being morbid. I am closer to the end of my life than I am to the beginning. Men in my family rarely live past their mid-70s, and I'm going to be 67. And... Uh, I'm, so I'm closing in on the end of my journey towards the Jordan River. I want to be Joshua. And you'll know more about that as we get closer uh, to the Jordan River. I want to be Joshua, who demonstrated his faith and commitment to God in the face of wa- a wildly unbelieving generation. I want to be Joshua. At the end of my journey, with all the bumps, with all the lumps, I stand at the shore of the Jordan River. I want to cross it. And I'm going to cross it. Because God has delivered me to the uttermost. He has saved me. So that's enough for mutterings and meanderings for today. Um, I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Here's Paige. Here's my coffee. Folks, I'm out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither should my thoughts be your thoughts. You need to think for yourself.